Hello, good afternoon, warm welcome to Joy Newsroom with me, Pius Kojobaka. Coming up in this edition, President Ekufado's pledge to protect the public purse comes under scrutiny as another of his appointees step aside in the wake of calls for a probe for possible corruption. Said it, and I'll repeat it again. Those who are coming to this administration thinking that it's an avenue for making a lot of money are going to be disappointed. They better go to the private sector. That is where people make money. President Ikufuado in search of departed sanitation minister Cecilia Bernadapai's replacement following a resignation yesterday. Today marks exactly three years since Madame Ikuyadente was brutally lynched. A coalition against witchcraft accusation is advocating an urgent law combat the ongoing menace of witchcraft accusations. We've got details of these and many others lined up for you. Please stay. Always a pleasure to have you on. Let's now begin the bulletin. And President Ikufuado has started the search for a new person to replace Cecilia Abinadapa as sanitation minister. Madame Dapa bowed to pressure and resigned yesterday following revelations. She kept huge sums of money in multiple currencies in her home, part of which was stolen by her domestic staff. Now, in her resignation address to the president, she said the amounts being quoted in the media had been exaggerated and did not represent what she and her husband had reported to the police. President Ekufuado, um, we have to go to the Facebook page of President Ekufuado to um, get the latest on that. And President Ikufuado, in accepting her resignation, did not comment on the specific allegations, but said he is confident that her integrity whilst in office will be fully established. Well, another statement issued by the Director of Communications at the Presidency, Eugene Ayin, said the President will soon appoint a new Minister for Sanitation and Water Resources. And um, that's the statement on your screens now there. Now, the matter was the main issue for discussion on news file yesterday, where political um, risk analyst and economist Dr. Thierry Champon said the amounts involved leaves one with no choice but to wonder how much cash the minister was keeping at her home. The first thing is, for, for me, it comes to me across as though she wasn't even aware that these monies had been stolen or taken from her until the point that the husband discovered that something untoward. That's a fact. So, so, so the question then is, how much more money was actually in the house that we don't know, right? And number two, if, or by the time you become a minister, or at the time you become a minister, you declare your assets, you declare your liabilities, we know all of that. So um, are we in a position to establish that these monies, because on the chart sheet that you read, Almost nine out of the, you know, ten or so charges, so probably about seven, directly says that this is, quote and unquote, the property of Sistria Abena Dapa, right? In fact, so, it is only count six, which is the value of the kente and suits that belong to the husband. To husband. Yes. So, so then, since she became a minister, we know how much ministers earn in this country. We know what they are um, paid every month. We should be in a position to then establish whether these monies, um, which she says were her property, was actually earned legitimately or not. Because what is very clear, and what we all have been talking about, is that Ghana is not poor. And it looks as though it is the, uh, uh, the national cake that is residing in people's bedrooms, to, 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 to put it you know, a bit more mildly in that sense. So we, we need to interrogate. As for money, 
you have the right to keep your money where you want it to be. And everybody also has a right to property. So what you have worked for and what you have earned is entirely yours, except those that you have to pay as task, uh, tax. Um, but in this situation, we, that is why, for example, the assets declaration regime would be helpful because you can easily refer to what um, she deposited when she was appointed as a minister, the records that indicate that she has so much assets. And then you compare that to um, the amount of money that she has been receiving as a minister or as a member of parliament or as both. And then you can easily draw the line and do the deductions and conclude that so much money could not have been acquired through legitimate means. Um, of course, the, the law also talks about gifts and so on. So you need to look at all of that. And then you conclude if then the money, the excess that is not accounted for can be legitimate money, or whether it, it came in through illicit means, which therefore suggests uh, money laundering issues, uh, brings that issue into the picture. And so keeping money in your, in your home is not wrong, but what money is it? And what is the money being used for? Because according to the facts, the money has been there for some time. And the people have been siphoning it off. And they thought that they had also hit a jackpot. So they continued to do that. And they couldn't even recognize that the money was being siphoned off. And so that tells you that there is more to it than meets the eye. That was Professor IPG to our, um, speaking on the matter yesterday on this file. But what can $1 million do? Dr. Thieu Champon again. So this news yesterday, I just started and I said, hey, is she running a savings and loans company in her house? Uh, because, I mean, it's not a small uh, amount of money. Uh, One million dollars, assuming it was even hundred dollar bills, normally would fit into the case, a small case that people tend to travel with. Again, One million dollars, just for the purposes of our uh, listeners, Today, the exchange rate is like 11.5, right? So that's uh, 11 million um, Ghana cities, so 11.5 million Ghana cities. It, to build a six-unit classroom block in Ghana would cost you roughly about 800 or so thousand. So that $1 million, or so 11.5 million, can build about 14 six-unit classroom blocks just for people to appreciate, you know, the amounts that we're talking about you know, in, in, in question here. For, for me, it comes to me across as though she wasn't even aware that these monies had been stolen or taken from her until the point that the husband discovered that something untoward. That's a fact. So, so, so the question then is, how much more money was actually in the house that we don't know? Now, President Ekufadu's pledge to protect the public purse is up for scrutiny yet again as anti-corruption campaigners are demanding a show of commitment and a desire to redeem his image as one who clears appointees for wrongdoings. Cecilia Brandapa, who until recently was Ghana's sanitation minister, has become the third appointee of President Ekufadu to leave office amid allegations of corruption and calls for a probe. There is more in the following reports. I've said it and I'll repeat it again. Those who are coming to this administration thinking that it's an avenue for making a lot of money are going to be disappointed. They better go to the private sector. That is where people make money, not in government. President Akufuado won his first presidential election in 2016 with a pledge to protect the public purse. The government has been confronted with various allegations of corruption. In April 2019, the presidency accepted the resignation of Minister of State Roxin Bukhari. This came in the wake of the then minister being heard in a leaked tip, allegedly trying to suppress the publication of a story through an offer of a bribe to a journalist. In November 2022, President Akufuado the appointment of Charles Edubwahi as Minister of State at the Finance Ministry. 
This was after he was captured on tape allegedly soliciting bribes for top government officials. The latest incident to engage the attention of anti-graft campaigners is the theft of $1 million on the residence of Cecilia Abnadapa, sparking spirited discussion on how she could have so much cash at home. She has since resigned. The Ghana Integrity Initiative's Maria Ada believes the president must show commitment and redeem his acquired image as one who clears appointees of wrongdoing. It is not enough for the president to continue to tell us that state institutions are acting while behind the scene things are being pulled mm. to frustrate processes from occurring. <laughs> we believe that for the president to redeem his uh, image and, and then also take off that um, uh, mantra that has been applied to him for some time now that uh, he is a clearing agent. We believe this is a time for him to act and act swiftly. The president has, however, in a letter to the former minister, expressed optimism that her integrity while in office will be established. And to some other stories, today marks exactly three years since Madame Ikria Dante was brutally lynched in Kafaba near Salaga in the Savannah region. To mark the third anniversary of this tragic incident, the Coalition Against Witchcraft Accusation, Kawa, is advocating an urgent need for legislation and a coordinated response to combat the ongoing social menace of witchcraft accusations, which primarily target older and vulnerable women. And I would like to read a part or excerpt of the statement issued um, by Kawa. It reads, these issues underscore the critical need for the anti-witchcraft accusation law. The bill has undergone initial processes and is currently ready for presentation in Parliament. However, it languishes in the files awaiting to be laid before the House, read, voted upon and passed into law. Kawa wants to know why the bill seems to be pushed aside. How many more women victims does Parliament need to take action on the bill? We understand the passing the bill will not eradicate witchcraft accusations um, initially or instantly, but it will pave the way for education and a change in attitudes and mindsets over time. Enacting this law will provide victims wasting their lives in the camps which confidence and the security they need to return to their homes. Um, call to action. We therefore call upon... Ghanaian society to raise and demand that the parliament, especially the speaker, to lay the anti-witchcraft accusation bill for second reading and passing into law. This parliament has an extraordinary opportunity to make history and we implore them not to let this opportunity slip by. The Coalition Against Witchcraft Accusation will continue to advocate tirelessly to ensure the bill does not end up in the dustbin of forgotten bills. By passing the bill into law, we will safeguard the lives and dignity of countless innocent individuals, promote social harmony, and demonstrate our commitment to justice and equality for all. It goes on to say, let us unite in this cause to bring an end to this deeply entrenched social menace. All right, so on Zoom is the executive director of the Senna Institute, Professor John Azuma, for more on this. Um, Professor um, Azuma, grateful you could join me on Join Newsroom. Now, I want to know why it has delayed, the witchcraft law has delayed for some time now. Why so? Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, uh, the bill, as we've said in the statement, is actually ready, and it is... Uh, with Parliament now, it has gone to the first reading, uh, but it needs to go to the second reading. And for some reason, there's a hold up of the bill in Parliament. It's a private member's bill, mm. and a lot of things have to have gone into getting Parliament to work on the bill. Uh, we, the civil society organisations that have come together to form Kawa, the Coalition Against Witchcraft Accusation. Uh, we have worked with Parliament and with the sponsors of the bill to get this bill to this state. But it looks like it has run into difficulty in Parliament, either A, because some members don't feel like they want to support the bill, or B, some members don't feel like them. Uh, and so Kawa is a very deeply concerned, as you rightly said, Today is the third three years, exactly three years when this old lady was lynched. Mm. 
And we heard what the president said. We heard what every Ghanaian came out and said. And three years on, we've had a lot of other lynchings, a lot of other murders, a lot of accusations. The camps are increasing in number. And this bill is still sitting in parliament. So we want people, uh, organizations like yours to put pressure on parliament to get this bill read and passed into law as soon as possible. It is interesting that the bill is at its second reading, uh, for which reason there isn't any progress being made. Don't you think it's about time um, Kawa also, you know, enhance its advocacy by way of educating parliamentarians on the essence of the bill, for which reason we need to have um, a smooth passage of the bill? That's exactly what we are doing now. We are engaging with the parliamentarians on a one-to-one basis. We are calling on Ghanaians who believe in this to really call their MPs wherever they are. And when we met some of the MPs at the drafting and the reading of the first bill, the draft in Kufurudria, there was bipartisan support. That was really, really very encouraging. Mm. All the MPs who were in the room from both sides of the house, they, they all overwhelmingly supported the bill. Not a single one uh, even abstained. And yet, the bill has reached this point, and I am from the north myself, and, and I, it pains me to say that those who are actually, among those who are not pushing this bill forward in parliament, are my fellow brothers and sisters, uh, northern parliamentarians. A lot of the women, uh, the victims, are our aunties, our sisters, our mothers in the north. Mm. They are those who get linked. And I would have thought that this would be a priority to our MPs uh, from both sides of the house who would push this bill through. But I, I, it may surprise you know, that some of them are not even interested, and I'm not surprised that I wouldn't be surprised that some of them would be opposed to the bill. Because the bill is so popular, and the practice is so popular in, 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 the, in, in those parts of the country. But we need other parliamentarians to really rally because the image of Ghana is at stake. Mm. It's not just the norm. The image of Ghana is at stake, and we must get, we must get this thing done. And every Ghanaian should call their MP to advocate to get this bill passed. Professor Azuma, um, won't you agree with those who believe that um, the uh, women who attacked Dente um, have uh, basically have been jailed? So it appears the law is working already. Thank you for raising that. Uh, I, 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 would, I, I have to say that I was pleased, and most of us were pleased when we had the verdict. Mm. Uh, it was long uh, overdue. It was long in coming. But at least better late than never. However, let us note that it was only the women who were caught physically beating the old lady who were convicted. And these women were not convicted of witchcraft accusation or anything. They were convicted for manslaughter. Mm. There were a lot of other men who were there, who watched it, who cheered the women on, who applauded them. Mm. In fact, it was men who accused this woman, who went and dragged her out of their home, and they, 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 they presided over the lynching. And my question is, where are all those men who preside over the lynching? Witchcraft accusation and witchcraft practice in the north is presided by men, not women. And so I was disappointed that only women were uh, found guilty. I would have wished to see some of those men punished. But the reason is that witchcraft accusation is not, a, it's not illegal. Mm. It's not criminalized in Ghana. So mm. they could not be charged for that. And that is, uh, but without accusation to, there will be no lynching. There will be no attacks. It is the accusation that leads to the attack. Mm. And that is why we are calling for this bill to be passed into law, criminalize the accusations. If this bill were in force, all those men who accused a queer dentist and participated in one way or the other would have been brought to court. That's Fi why we need this bill. All right. Finally, any timeline you are looking or giving Parliament to expedite processes to pass this bill? Yes, we are hoping and, 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 and pleading with Parliament Parliament, this parliament has an opportunity to make history. And this bill will be a so significant a bill 
that this it will go into records as this is the parliament that passed this bill. And I hope that they will pass this bill during the lifespan of this parliament. Mm. And we, in fact, we were given assurance that the bill will be passed this year. I know the president is ready to sign this bill. We know that for a fact. We just need parliament and we are calling on the speaker. Some of us have met the speaker. He is very supportive of the bill. We are calling upon the speaker to, to, to revisit the bill, get the bill laid, and push it through parliament so that under his speakership, this bill will go under his belt as having passed this bill, which will redeem Ghana's image internationally and bring life back to the women who are languishing in the camps. Very well. Thank you very much, uh, Professor John Azuma. He is the Executive Director of Sena Institute speaking to us there. Pleasure you could join us on Joy Newsroom. To some other stories, Minority in Parliament has rejected the first Deputy Speaker's verdict, vehemently opposing the characterization of the Eighth Parliament as the worst in the last 30 years. The recent parliamentary business stalled due to lack of quorum um, has further fueled the controversy with accusations being hurdled between the minority and the majority. Now, minority MPs are pointing fingers at the majority, attributing the legislative challenges to their members' engagement in campaigns and presidential aspirations. Listen to MP for Ningo Pram Pram, Sam George. I'm saying that the problem in Parliament today, in this eighth Parliament, is simply the inability of the MPP side to stick to whatever bargains that have been made over and over again. And if you remember, the former minority leader, Harun Idrisu, has had course on the floor of the House to tell Chairman Sambonsu, majority leader, that this is not what we agreed to. This is not what we, 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 had, we discussed in conclave because Chair will come on the floor and change his position. And the same thing is happening now, even with that too. And so when the backbench takes the position and says that, look, we will not cooperate with the government side, we've taken that position. Every decision you take comes at a political cost. And I've, I've seen Dr. Rashid's comments about our position and all of that. We, we are minded by that. But the failure of government to conduct its business is not because of the minority. It's simply because the members of the government side, the majority in parliament, have decided to put the campaign of Alan Chermantin Kennedy, Japan, and Dr. Mahmoud Baumia above government parliamentary business. They are not able to make the 92 members because their members of parliament are on the field campaigning, campaigning for their presidential candidates. And now they are also beginning to look at preparing themselves for their own parliamentary primaries. That is where the crux of the matter is. And so you see, in this, in this situation, the government side would need to realize that you can't use threats, you can't use, like Arnold on Prayer is doing, you can't use the, the, the approach, Arnold on Prayer's approach mm. to this matter of holding press conferences and calling people out will not solve the problem. And parliamentary business is expected to stall further. That's according to political risk analyst Dr. Thierry Champon, who is asking Ghanaians to brace themselves. He believes this will be the norm as we head into 2024. It's right. It's neither here nor there. But the big thing for me going forward is that these delays would probably become the norm as we go into the election year. Right? Everybody suddenly is getting into campaign mode. Mm. We've got um, parliamentary primaries. We've got presidential primaries that are upcoming latter part of this year, next year. And um, normally even the end of the, the, lap, the, the first quarter of the election year, most of the MPs don't even come to the House at all. So, of course, parliamentary business is going to stop. Certain key bills, uh, acts, and things that have to be passed, including what we were just discussing a few moments ago, the you know, new Public Officers Conduct Act, which is part of the uh, IMF conditionalities, may be, be stored. That That is the the challenge that we were dealing with. But for me, I, like I said, I don't think it's necessarily an NDC problem. There are people on the N MPP side also that don't turn up, and therefore you don't have the quorum mm. being formed. You're still watching Joy Newsroom here with me, Pius Kojo Baka. There's great stories for you after this break.
crystal clear and thrilling podcast and live shows, download and listen to us on Apple, Spotify, TuneIn, Google Podcasts, MyJoy Online, Amazon services like Echo, Amazon Music, and... Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to demonstrate to you the superior properties of Flamingo Paint as compared to other paint brands on the market. We take equal quantities of Flamingo Paint and this ordinary paint. We then dilute them with water. And now, let the test begin. The gentleman on the left is going to apply the ordinary paint and the gentleman on my right will use the Flamingo Superior Paint. As you can clearly see, Flamingo has the obvious better hiding. Furthermore, Flamingo has painted a much larger area. You know, one bucket of Flamingo paint is equal to several buckets of any other paint brand on the market. Flamingo paint is made with superior formulation to give superior durability, superior hiding, superior coverage. Flamingo paint, simply superior. Hello, welcome back. There is an increase in the demand for an urgent government intervention to provide holistic care for the mentally ill. Attempts by non-governmental organizations to complement governmental efforts have been overstretched due to the immense need for human and financial resources. Reducing stigma and ensuring access to quality mental health care in Ghana remains a mission yet to be accomplished. Hano Odame has been exploring the case of mentally um, health care in this feature titled Minds on the Streets. Sometimes I feel very bad because some are very young and some are very old too and some too they are not clothing well so sometimes you you feel bad about it it is not only about how they feel but the pain they can also inflict on anyone they come by in august 2022 a mentally challenged woman hit a man with stones at this particular spot. For those who stay and live around, it was a moment of reawakening. For how long are they going to tolerate or look over their shoulders when they see a mentally challenged person in their vicinity? That torturous incident lingers on, on the minds of many who heard it, but most especially, on the minds of those who witnessed that horrific act. The thought of being attacked, abused, or beaten by a mentally challenged person is an act no one would want to experience. It's quite frustrating of late. Um, I do meet them. Sometimes they come towards you whilst you are working and um, you are a little scared, especially during the night and you feel you should run away. And when you try to, they try to follow you. It is something which is really, you know, uncomfortable. And I feel the government should, in a way, try to put them together in one place. You know, some are very threats to life. That intervention to get them off the streets was announced on March 2022 by the then medical director of the Accra Psychiatric Hospital, Dr. Pinaman Apau. She revealed the redevelopment of the facility into a 220-bed hospital was under government's Agenda 111 program and was part of many other projects, including the construction of 101 district hospitals, six regional hospitals, and two psychiatric hospitals. 
The first date that was communicated to management was the end of June 2022. However, updates that I got recently from the coordinator of the Agenda 111 project indicates that currently they are doing what we call technical evaluation on tenders that had been submitted. But almost a year on, not much has happened in terms of a pull down and a fixed lift. One would think the facility hosting some of the mentally challenged persons in the national capital will be rid of. another person even if even the person is not a madman or the person is not a mad woman you understand is we call it a little violence it's something that is not good at all at all former director of the Accra psychiatric hospital dr kwisio say delsing on this development as at the time the idea came to pull down the structures and build new ones we had got to the point where it didn't seem fitting for a facility of our age in Ghana. So the idea was to pull it down and rebuild it. Uh, all things were more or less in place, but somehow it's stalled. I'm sure it's not to totally dead. I'm sure the plans are still there, that somewhere along the line, uh, you'll get the funding to continue the program. That was it. Now, you mentioned two new psychiatric hospitals. Yes, one in the northern belt, one in the middle belt. As far as I know, they are still on the drawing board. Uh, land has been secured, and, and they started building them. So we hope that funds will continue to be available for them to finish building them. And if they finish, it will be wonderful. Because for now, all our three facilities are down south. As a nation waits to see the fulfillment of the redevelopment promise, we should have seen the completion of the redevelopment promise. The mentally challenged on the streets will perhaps remain, and the fears of many will also perhaps remain. Some of them, in fact, they look uh, scary, and I think it is not right to be walking on the way and maybe it's coincidentally, you run through them and then some of them, are, in fact, what they can do to you. And because he's a mad person or mentally challenged person, you can't take him or her to court or anything like that. I am Hannah Odami for joining us. Moving on to some other stories, the Leclerbi Senior High School in the Afajato South District in the Volta region, which was established in 1965, is in a state of distress, putting the lives of its students at risk. A visit by Joy News's Elvis Washington revealed numerous challenges that demand immediate attention to ensure the security and well-being of the students. Established in 1965 by the late Professor Alexander Kuma, an esteemed educationist and philanthropist, the Klebi Senior High School is now plagued by multiple issues that cast a shadow over the well-being of its students. With a current student population of under a thousand and majority of students residing on campus as boarders, the school faces a lot of challenges that hampers the academic development. However, the most alarming concerns lies with an abandoned classroom block that has remained in a state of neglect for almost four years. Despite its evident structural defects, the school has no alternative but to utilize the compromised space, risking the safety of students. Visible cracks, a disjointed ceiling, and leakages during rainfall further demonstrate the precarious condition of the structure. The dining hall, serving as a multi-purpose facility, also falls far short of acceptable standards. The senior girls and boys prefects of the school throw some light on the many challenges facing the school. Yes. When it's raining, sometimes they'll have to come out of the classroom and then join the seniors in their classroom. And even in my class, I'm an agricultural science student. My class leaks whenever it rains. We have inadequate furniture. 
for the classrooms and then any other occasion at all. The first and then second years, even the third years most especially, but the first years of all, whenever it's time for classes, they would have to move to the long hall, carry benches to their classrooms, and then study. When it's break time, they will have to carry it back as well. Some of them have to sit in their decks about three or four before writing and then all those stuff. Also, our ICT laboratory together with the chemistry lab got bent some years back. So for now, we find it very difficult to have a practicals. Almost all the departments we have inadequate teachers. Mm -hmm. But the visual arts class most especially, they don't have any teacher at all. The teachers that come are part-time teachers. We also don't have friends in the school. Mm -hmm. And then with this, you know, students in every school, they are always stubborn. So they just need to tell anyhow and then do whatever they want to have. Mm -hmm. Some girls don't even sleep in the dorm. Really? Yeah, they come at dorm to mix with us so that. We just have our bad. At the security personnel here, there are only three and very old at age. Mm -hmm. And aside them being three and then old, they only operate at night. We have poor lightning system, water supply. Students will have to go to the next town to get water from the stream or tap from the water factory nearby before we can get water for the kitchen to cook our dining food and all those stuff. We are about 389 girls in the dormitory, but the water closets we have are just seven in number. So sometimes if you are on it and then somebody also feels for nature, because the person just run to the bush or shit into rubber and then throw away. And we have inadequate um, infrastructures in the school. Classroom blocks is inadequate in the school. So we suffer and we are clustered in the room. And the room to the classroom blocks, they are fragile, they are too old for and it's risky to be in it. And we have an uh, abandoned distant, uh, in, uh, uncompleted building mm -hmm. over there. And some students who they are living or staying inside, and it's very risky for their lives to be in. So we lack toilet facilities in the school because we have inadequate water supply in the dormitory. So we have to get some pit over here so that we can uh, dispose of our metabolic waste. So that's why we are using the bush over here. Due to how we are using the beds intermittently, it got broken down. So right now, if you enter any dormitory at all, we can even find two or three beds in the dormitory. So some of us, we sleep on the floor. So in the dormitory, we have poor lighting system. And the path leading to the dormitory, you can see there's no pool or any street lights. So if in the night we are passing any reptiles or any crawling uh, animal can easily attack us. And on campus, we lack molding dining hall. That's the kitchen attached to the dining hall so that we can convey the food easily to the dining hall. If in case it's raining, we're struggling carrying the food to the Students dining hall. of the school have to battle with bed bug infestation, lack of adequate toilet facilities, among others. They are thus forced to use the nearby bush as a temporary place of convenience. One of the challenges we have in the dormitory are we have bear bags is taking us always at the night, especially when they make my chance. We used to get up in the rest and then start biting people. Uh, people are finding difficult to sleep. Some climb outside to sleep on the corridor. And some are also the and then scorpions from the Some came to the dormitories because of the As for our toilets, we lack water for in the dormitory, so we are not used to the toilet they give us in the dormitory. So we to dig some holes at the beach of the same good for our toilets. Like we infrastructure. The students have to be carrying desks and chairs up and down or arrange the only dining hall that we have every Wednesdays and Sundays where we have assemblies and church service. So we need to create the processes. There is every room when a teacher is teaching. The teacher has to stop because of the room. The center is inside the classroom. So 
Uh, it's up to stop the learning to that we need for the win to stop before we Quite apart from these challenges, the school has inadequate water supply and students have to walk long distances to fill these huge polytanks for the kitchen staff. Even that, they are served with breakfast without sugar and bread. Mm-hmm. No bread, no bath loaf, nothing. We are, we are in it like that. Even some time ago, we had Tom Brown without sugar. So when you are coming from the dormitory and then you have sugar, you carry it along. When they serve you, then you get your own thing to suit your taste. The unhappy kitchen staff could not hide their frustration from the cameras. Elvis Washington filed that report. Now, the Ghana Integrated Iron and Steel Development Corporation has engaged five communities at KJB in the OT region on the possible impact of iron ore mining activities on their livelihood. The corporation has assured residents of minimal destruction to the soil at the exploratory stages and compensation would be paid in the case of destruction to any food or cash crop. Peter Seno has more in the following reports. Ghana Integrated Iron and Steel Development Corporation just embarked on stakeholder and community engagement in five communities in the Oti region. Asatu, Wawaso, Kosamba, Jamrume and Katepi were the communities visited in KGB district. JISDEG briefed the chiefs about their presence in their community. We have enjoyed the occupation for some time now. Since the start of iron ore uh, discovery in the area and subsequent studies that have been carried out, you have been so cooperative to the cause of the Ghana Integrated Iron and Steel Development Corporation, and we appreciate that. We all know that when we find the iron ore, there is need for more studies to be done to know the quality and quantity of the ore, which will inform further decision making. So with us is the seven star um, group that we are here to introduce to you, to let you know that they are here to still continue the studies that we have been talking about. DS is to get proper geological information of the iron ore blocks that we have in the area and then to see how we can collaborate to uh, go into mining in the future. The chiefs and elders of Asatu also raised concerns about their farms and livelihood. What kind of uh, uh, activity will really go on that may warrant the destruction of the environment that may affect farmers who are farming there? But the assurance came that very minimal portions of iron ore blocks would be explored to determine the quantity and quality of all deposits. The JSDEC team later visited the communities and had engagements with them. They also visited the district chief executive, Wilson Agbanyo, to brief him on the presence of the exploratory team in his jurisdiction. He also echoed the worries of his people about destruction to crops. Cut it down, cocoa trees or any other. This land tenure system. Yes. Even though the chiefs and others are delegated to the people. Yes. I think when you come back, we have to meet here again. Sure. We invite them. Okay. We take records. Yes. For them to say that they have signed. Everybody has put his signature. Sure. That if it is Baba Taiju's farm, yes. nobody will say that I sold. My grandfather gave them land to you long time. Because of that, I'm taking part of that. You know, this is happening. Yeah. Sure. Nasrullah Abdullah is the director for JSDEC in charge of corporate affairs and international relations. According to him, the reception has been good at KGB. 
NPP has also been responding to concerns raised by residents of Akpafu, Lolobi Buri, and Santo Kofi earlier not to allow any iron ore mining activities in their communities. The residents in June this year formed an anti-iron ore mining committee to kick against any exploratory activities in the area. Nasrullah Abdullah says Dizdeg intends to engage the communities further to allay their fears. We intend to go to the people to explain further to them what our plans are in terms of how we intend to safeguard the environment. Some of their concerns have bordered on environmental degradation. But it is important to state that in the case of iron ore mining, one cannot do illegal mining with iron ore mining. You cannot do galamsey with iron ore mining. And the issue of water pollution doesn't come into play when you are dealing with iron ore mining. It is when you are engaged in the mining of gold and other minerals that you may be concerned about pollution to water bodies. Because in the case of iron ore, you don't need water to be washing it as you do for gold mining. And so the issue of water pollution does not come into the fray. So we have to go down there to explain to them. And in the next couple of weeks, we are going to have intensive community engagement in the area to allay the fears of residents in the area. Peter Sanu for Joy News. Moving on to some other stories, Evangelical Presbyterian Development and Relief Agency launches projects targeted at women's empowerment. The Evangelical Presbyterian Church through the Evangelical Presbyterian Development and Relief Agency has launched a women's empowerment project with the sole aim of uplifting the girl child. But the Gender Equity and Support Against Early Child and Forced Marriage project seeks to focus on behavioral change to address issues about child and early marriages, teen pregnancy and abuse in the Ghanaian society. According to the United Nations International Children's Emergency Fund, one in five girls aged 20 to 25 are married before the age of 18, pegging incidents of child marriage at 27% in Ghana and at 36.2% in rural Ghana in 2011. The illegal act denies young girls of good health, education, and the choice of when and whom to marry, violating their fundamental human rights. Child and early marriages have been identified to perpetuate poverty as victims are denied education and school training, hence remain dependent on their husbands. Uh, the issue of child rights violation is a national canker and same prevails in the Volta region. Usually because of uh, our cultural background and how we perceive children to be seen and not heard. And also about the fact that there are a lot of issues of poverty and uh, lack of capacity of many people as parents. Usually you see people becoming parents as teenage mothers without the resources and the capacity to provide care for these children. And in those events, usually what happens is abuse, neglect, abandonment and other violations of the right of the child the evangelical presbyterian church therefore launched an advocacy project with a focus on women's empowerment to complement efforts in finding solutions to the practice with the evangelical presbyterian development and relief agency as implementing body the project would focus on mobilizing families and communities providing services and establishing and implementing laws and policies the coordinator of the gender equity and support against early child and forced marriages project charles sachi explained that the project would be carried out in three phases across all 16 regions of the country we are going to divide the country into presbyteries. So each presbytery will have a, a... These people we are going to train, they are the combat members, community-based anti-violence teams. So they will organize workshops and uh, community fora and interactive actions to educate them on how to assert their, uh, 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 their, their rights. So the girls will be empowered to even fight for their own rights. It's a behavior change project. So at the end of it, it is not going to be used output. You know, if we say how many people attend this workshop, we say oh, about 250 people attend the output. That's the only the output of the workshop. But the outcome, which is the behavior change, that's what we are looking for. The Gender Equity and Support Against Early Child and Forced Marriages Project 
aims at building a society that would enable young girls to become accomplished women. Fred Kwame Asai, Joy News, who... You're still watching Joy News Room. Business is next after this break. How do I acquire a litigation free land or property in this country? Should I buy a house or go through the building process? If I should buy, what are the critical stages and pitfalls? If I should build, how do I get started? Registration of land, who can help me? Can I just draw my own plan and build? What are the steps in getting a building permit? Rising cost of building materials, any, any other options? These artisan square seems to be ripping me off my money. What, what, what can I do? For this and other building related issues, join Emmanuel Owusu-Ansa on The Pyramid Show every Sunday from 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. on your favorite channel, Joy News Television. Hello, welcome to the business part of the news. And the electricity company of Ghana, in a bid to guarantee robust and reliable power distribution network, is expected to train over 3,000 certified electrical contractors which work for the company. And the training, which currently focuses on the effective earth system, will also has, um, have other models targeted at equipping these contractors to ensure safe distribution network. Director of ECG Training School in Tema, Engineer Ahin um, Obusu-Efi, speaking with Joy Business, said the training is crucial. It's considered crucial in ensuring safety around any electrical installation or gadgets. The earthen calls by the electricity company of Ghana, ECG, is expected to introduce these contractors who have been trained in batches to the latest technology and know-how in designing and construction of a reliable distribution network. According to Director of ECG Training School in Tema, Engineer Ahin Osufiye, by ensuring safety, workers of ECG and contractors do not end up killing themselves, damage any equipment, or cause any distraction. He says this type of training could be organized once a year, but there are others done every two or three years and refreshes as and when it becomes necessary. Uh, it's very critical because uh, they are part of our workforce. Most of our work are executed by the third third party contractors and if they have to deliver to our standards they have to be trained on what the best practice and what the standards are so giving them a training will give the assurance that they do a good job and that that will ensure that our network uh, also work properly uh, if they are not trained we'll give them work they do work that will not meet our standards and that will impact on our on our network so basically giving them the competences that we needed to ensure that uh, they deliver to requirements. Lead facilitator and general manager of ECG's Energy Consulting and Telco Business Directorate, Dr. George Edufo says the modular program aims to train the contractors to deliver effective power distribution system for ECG. Dr. Edufo explained that there is system earthing done to protect the power system and equipment earthing to protect gadgets used in homes. If the earthing is not there and you happen to be in contact with the gadgets, it can be electrocuted. So ethane is very key. Now what we are doing here is that is to equip them with the necessary skill to install a very effective ethane. I'll give you an example. We have, if you visit electrical installation and then the, the installation is not properly ethane, in event of fault, if you happen to be within the premises, you can be killed from what we call a step voltage. If you open your legs, there's a voltage between you, your two legs, and that can kill you. And another thing that can also happen is that if you happen to be within the establishment and you are in contact with any metallic objects, you can also be killed from a touch voltage. So ethane is very important. What we are doing today is to ensure that we train them in such a way that when they go to our installation, they can design ethane systems that is very effective for protection of our infrastructures and for uh, I mean, the public.
President of Ghana Electrical Contractors Association, Awao Sakib Mohammed, indicated that the reliability and safety of distribution network depend on the action and inaction of contractors, hence the need for such a modular program. Now, uh, we are here today to undergo training on effective ethan. It's just one of the several modules that the electrical contractors, ECG certified electrical contractors, will, will be going through in the course of uh, their contracting period with ECG. Now, uh, reliability and safety of ECG or distribution networks rely on the actions and inactions of electrical contractors. And you also agree with me that technology and standards have changed over time. It has therefore become necessary to prepare or train contractors who render services to DCG on best practices so that they will be able to construct very robust uh, distribution systems, uh, transformer installations and all that so that DCG can best serve their customers. We are all aware that Ghana has enough or sufficient generation capacity. A lot of the faults you find, a lot of the outages you find in our communities are localized faults. And these are mostly due to one fault or the other. A well-trained electrical contractor will be able to, to, to install or to construct a very reliable system which will help prevent all these unnecessary outages. Meanwhile, Director of Energy Consulting and Telco Business of ECG, John K. Amihe, added that his art will provide consultancy and take part utility assessment, energy audit, and provide training as done with the contractors, among other functions. And that's it for business. And of course, that's how we part company here on Joy Newsroom with me, Pios Kojo Baka. You can get good stories and great stories when you log on to myjoyonline.com as well as business forward slash business. Do enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Bye.